Okay. Uh, thanks all for well, waking up this early and uh, coming to see this talk. Uh, so the talk is about, uh, well, it's mostly uh, the research that I did uh, at my university. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, and there I do research on security and privacy on the web, uh, which is like a broad thing. Uh, but mainly my uh, current focus is on uh, side channel attacks in the web and in the browser, uh, as I will be talking about today. Um, so the concept uh, of timing attacks is that they're a type of side channel attack, uh, which means that uh, it's not a direct attack like a SQL injection or something, but you try to infer information uh, based on uh, observations that you make uh, from the uh, environment. And while well, these attacks are definitely not new, uh, they've been known for decades, uh, but it's, it was mainly applied in uh, cryptography. Uh, and there it was used to retrieve uh, cryptographic keys or retrieve the message that was sent, uh, well, the encrypted message that was sent. Uh, or to exploit secure connections. So for instance, I think most of you have heard about this Lucky 13 attack. Uh, it's also a type of uh, timing attack. So the concept of timing attacks is pretty simple. Uh, first, you perform an action, which can be pretty much anything. Uh, but it's of course based, well, the action that you do or make is of course based on the system that you're gonna attack. Uh, then you measure the time uh, from a starting point until the end. So that's something that you observe. Uh, and then you compare or analyze this timing measurement uh, with some other timing measurements or just uh, its absolute value. And then, well, you can exploit it. So some time ago I came up with this new type of timing attack called the drunkenness timing attack. Uh, so in the drunkenness timing attack, you try to determine whether a certain person is drunk or not. So to do this, you first perform an action. So you slap the person in the face, uh, and then you measure the time it takes uh, from well, the starting point, so the slap in the face, uh, until that person slaps you back. And well, if he slaps you back quite quickly, well, you can assume that he's not drunk. And if it's, it's a long time, uh, the person is drunk. Uh, but of course, I, well, in my research, I like to do experiments. Uh, so <laughs> that's what I did. Uh, so I have this test subject who wanted to re remain anonymous, but that didn't happen. So it's Matthias Berens. Uh, so uh, I went to him and I was wondering, well, it was like in the middle of the day, and I was wondering whether he was drunk. Uh, so I performed the drunkenness timing attack. So I went to him and I slapped him in the face. Uh, and so that's when I start my timer. Uh, so you see he falls down <laughs> and quite quickly he slaps me back. Uh, so it takes about three seconds before he slaps me back. So is he drunk? Well, probably not. But of course, that's just one measurement that we took. So yeah, in order to make sure that this time it actually works, we need to do another timing measurement. And there, preferably, Matthias would be drunk. So <laughs> then I gave him some uh, nice Belgian beers. Uh, and after a few minutes, well, because he can't really hold his liquor, uh, he was drunk. Uh, so I knew he was drunk, so I performed uh, the timing attack again. So I go to him, and I slap him in the face. And then again, I start my timer. Uh, and now you see he has trouble getting up. So it takes quite a while, in the end, yeah, he slaps me back, so 
it's like eight seconds. So again, the question, is Matthias drunk? Well, yes, and that's because the second timing measurement was significantly higher than the first timing measurement. So basically, that's how timing attacks work. Uh, so it, with the drunkenness timing attack, the response time of the user or the victim uh, relates to its, well, the person's drunkenness. Uh, and the same goes for uh, well, recovering a cryptographic key. So there you measure the time it takes to execute something, and the time it takes is related to whether a certain bit of the key or the message is one or zero. Uh, the same thing goes for uh, the lucky 13 attack. Uh, so there you measure the time it takes until you receive a TLS error, and that gives you some information about whether the padding uh, of the uh, encrypted thing uh, was correct, and knowing that uh, allows you to retrieve the message that was sent. And then uh, there are the web-based time index, which will be uh, the main focus of today. So these web-based time index, they're also not new. They've been known for uh, a very long time, so since 2000, and to give you an idea uh, how long this is, uh, so in 1995, uh, cookies were first introduced, so five years after cookies were introduced, and well, they weren't widely used uh, for some years after that, uh, timing attacks had already been discovered. Uh, and then a bit later on, uh, there were some more advanced attacks, uh, like uh, this nice thing by uh, Paul Stone, uh, where he could uh, read out the, well, the, the value of a certain pixel in an iframe by adding uh, SVG and CSS things uh, to make the well to make the GPU render uh, rendering time uh, take a different time uh, based on the color of the pixel. Uh, and in the same year, uh, Eduardo Vela uh, wrote this nice blog post about uh, well, a timing attack where you, where uh, input of the attacker is compared with a certain secret, and the time it takes to compare this, uh, well, so it's the JavaScript execution time, uh, it's related to the secret. So that allows you to extract information about a secret. And then you have in the, well, they were, I think, first introduced in the academic world uh, by Bortz and Bone. Uh, so you ha they introduced the concept of uh, direct timing attack and cross-site timing attack. So a direct timing attack, uh, well, I will show an example of this. So here you have your attacker and your, uh, well, server that's going to be attacked. And the attacker will try to uh, brute force uh, the password of uh, the Batman user. Uh, and to do this, he will uh, send a post request uh, and measure how long it takes until he receives an error. But well, with the username, he puts Batman, which matches here. Uh, but for the password, he uh, well, type, well, enters something like AAA. Uh, but uh, because the first letter doesn't match the first letter of the password, the well, the attack, uh, well, the server will very early respond with an error. Uh, so that allows the attacker to know that most likely A is not the first character of the password. So then he tries again with uh, B A A. Now you see that the first letter matched, so the server compared the second uh, character, uh, which didn't match, uh, so then an error was still returned, but now the attacker learned that B was most likely uh, a correct guess because the timing was higher than before. Uh, so, well, by repeating this process, the attacker can try to uh, brute force the password of uh, the user. 
of course, uh, these things uh, only work in uh, well a very optimal setup, uh, which is most of the times not the case for the attacker. Uh, so there's uh, many limitations uh, regarding these direct timing attacks. So one of the ma major issues is that you have to deal with uh, irregular irregularities on the network. So any jitter or congestion will mess up the timing measurements and will require the attacker to either make more measurements or just uh, don't let him succeed in his attack. Also, the, well, the concurrent users that are using the service uh, may influence the timing measurements because the, the load on the server will vary because of, well, if there's more users, it, the load will be higher uh, and so on. But some smart people came up with uh, solutions for these attackers. So the main thing is that uh, attack, well, the closer you get to the victim server, uh, well, the more precise your timing measurements can be. And well, in the in the well cloud architecture, uh, this can go to quite extreme forms. Uh, so you can try to uh, make sure that your VM gets uh, hosted on the same physical machine, and that allows you to do some. Uh, well, cache attacks, uh, and well, uh, it al also allows you to use very precise timing methods, like uh, in the order of microseconds or even less. Uh, and if you then use some additional statistical tests, uh, many attacks will uh, succeed. Uh, but well, unfortunately, it did, would take a very long time to explain all this. It's not really the focus of this uh, presentation, so I will just recommend that you read about these things because they're really interesting. Uh, and I'll move on to the main topic of uh, this talk, uh, namely uh, cross-site timing attacks. So these type of timing attacks are quite different from the direct ti timing attacks because with the cross-site timing attacks, uh, the request is no longer sent by uh, the attacker, but here the attacker uh, makes this, the victim send the request. And because uh, the web was developed in such a wonderful way, uh, all, uh, all requests to third-party content uh, will have cookie attached to them. Uh, so. This means that the response uh, that the user will get based on the uh, request that was sent uh, will be uh, based on the state of that user. So for instance, if a user is logged in, he will see a dashboard if you, uh, re if you request the root of the domain and otherwise it will say that you're not logged in and you need to log in to see something. So then when you're logged in, the response will be large, and when you're not logged in, uh, the response will be small. And then the attacker can measure uh, the response time, uh, so the time it takes to download the resource uh, with uh, JavaScript. So basically, you can load an image, uh, set the source, and then start this timer, uh, and when the image uh, since this uh, on error event, uh, the attacker can stop his timer because, well, typically the attacker is not interested in images, but rather HTML pages, and these are not valid images. So that's why you uh, listen on the on error event. And uh, so these attacks, uh, the main goal of them is to violate the same origin policy. Uh, and just because it's so important, I will briefly zoom in to the same origin policy. So it's one of the main security principles that exist on the web. And basically it says uh, that uh, well, uh, so, well, a certain origin, uh, so for instance attacker.com, 
cannot read anything uh, from example.com, so from an other origin. Uh, so, well, it's not just the content that should be secret, but also uh, the length of resources uh, should be secret because, uh, well, because the responses are based on the state of the user and uh, if the length uh, is impacted by this, uh, the attacker can uh, well, learn things about the state of the user. Uh, well, and this contains a lot of private information uh, as I will show later on. So I'll give a brief uh, well, overview of how this attack would work. So here you have a social network uh, consisting of two groups. So you have the Batman group and the Joker group. And uh, here you have uh, the victim. And this victim is browsing to a non-malicious website. Uh, for instance, uh, google.com. And google.com has this malicious advertiser. Uh, well, it wouldn't make sense that it's google.com because Google is an advertiser. But anyway, uh, let's say this is New York Times and New York Times has a malicious uh, advertiser. Uh, and well, this malicious advertiser, he can execute JavaScript, but only in the maliciousadvertiser.com domain, uh, so he can't read out any information from this social network. Uh, and this advertiser will try to determine whether this user uh, belongs to the Batman group or the Joker group, because of, obviously the advertisements that would be shown to the user will depend on which group he belongs to. Uh, so what the advertiser does is he makes the user initiates a request to the Batman resource and because the user is part of the Batman group, because he's Robin, uh, the response will be rather, rather big. Uh, so it will take around four seconds. Uh, then he does the same thing but with the Joker group. So he requests the Joker resource, uh, but as you can see, uh, the response that's returned is rather small. Uh, so the, well, the time it will take to da download this resource is also much smaller. So uh, the attacker measures that it's uh, yeah, around two seconds. So that, that's a lot less than the four seconds that he saw before. So that allows this uh, malicious advertiser to determine that the user is from the Batman group. But of course, uh, these things only work in uh, ideal situations, which never occur in the wild. Uh, because, well, in the wild, a request might look like this, so it moves over the internet, has some congestion. So, as you can see, the timing measurement of the attacker, now for the Joker group, it's uh, six seconds, which was larger than it was for the Batman group. So, uh, yeah, this prevents the attacker from learning anything uh, because he can't know for sure that uh, this response time was for the Joker group and it would always be smaller than for the Batman group. Uh, so there's, well, these Time attacks have uh, several limitations. So there's first the network irregularities, which were the si well similar uh, as with the uh, direct time attacks, but in this case there's, they are worse because the attacker can't control on which network the user is. So if he's on a bad wireless network, then the uh, well network timings will be uh, will contain a lot of jitter. And uh, then there's uh, gzip compression, so that makes that the difference in response size is a lot smaller, uh, which makes it much harder to detect that there's a difference. And uh, so one of the things that an attacker can do if the timing measurements aren't always correct or there's jitter on the timing measurements is to uh, well, take a lot of timing measurements and then do something like take the average. Uh, 
but in this case, the attacker will uh, need a round trip for every measurement uh, that he takes. And if there's some kind of rate limiting on the service, uh, his attack simply won't work. So that's where uh, the browser-based timing attacks come in. Uh, so these are a new type of timing attack, which well, try to overcome uh, all of the limitations, or at least most of the limitations of the classic uh, cross-site timing attacks. So the goal here is to start your timing measurement only after a resource has been downloaded. And by doing so, uh, well, you don't have any jitter or any irregularities of, of the network that could impact your timing measurement. Uh, well, another uh, thing is that these uh, browser-based timing attacks are much more accurate, uh, which allows you to determine with more cert certainty uh, which of two resources is the bigger one. Um, and for some of the timing attacks that I will explain later, a resource only needs to be downloaded once. And once it's downloaded, you can obtain a lot of measurements in a very short time interval. Uh, so this is what the uh, browser-based timing attacks would look like. So again, you make the request with the response, but you see that only after the response has been received, you start your timing measurements, uh, and you measure the time it takes to process this resource instead of download this resource. Uh, so there's three types of uh, processing that you can measure in the browser. So first is uh, to try to parse a certain resource as a in a specific format. Uh, so for instance, by trying to parse an HTML document as a video, uh, and if you m manage to measure the time it takes to uh, process this, uh, so the, pro the processing time of the CPU, uh, you will, well, learn the, well, learn an estimate of the size of the resource. And the same goes for storing or retrieving a certain response from the cache, uh, or putting in it into the cache. Um, so I will show, well, a very basic time, it, well, the most basic one, uh, where you measure the time it takes to parse a certain uh, resource as a video. So first you create a video element and you add two event listeners. So the first event listener is on the uh, suspend event. And interestingly, uh, this event will fire as soon as the download of the video is complete. So that's when you start your timing measurement. Uh, and because, well, the time it takes to parse this element as a this resource as a video is rather small. It's best to use the high performance uh, resource timing, so the window that performance that now. Uh, and you well, know that a resource has uh, stopped parsing as soon as the error event fires. So that's when you stop your measurements. And then you can simply set the source of the video to, well, the thing you know, want to know the size of, and uh, you measure the time, and then, uh, well, that's all you need. Uh, so th there's also another trick that you can do, and that's to use uh, application cache. And that's, uh, so there you can first put uh, this resource that you want to know the size of in the application cache, so then it gets stored. Um, on well, on the disk. Uh, so then every time you uh, set the source of a video element, it will take it from the cache instead of making a request to the network. So that allows you to uh, well, do these timing measurements uh, very quickly. So another type of timing attack in the browser is uh, the cache storing timing attack. Uh, so 
there you will measure the time it takes to uh, well, have this response object and put it into the cache. So uh, you make the re uh, request object. So these things are using the well, service worker related APIs. Uh, so you have your request object with the URL you want to know the size of, uh, some options which well, make sure that the cookies are attached to this request, uh, and then some bogus requests. Uh, so first you fetch the resource, uh, and once it's downloaded, you know that you can stop, uh, start your timer, and then uh, you simply put it into the cache with the cache API. Uh, so this allows you to put any resource into the cache, uh, which I think is a pretty strange thing, uh, security-wise. Uh, but anyway, uh, and so once it's put into the cache, uh, you can stop your timer. And so the difference here will uh, allow you to infer some information about the size of the resource because a larger resource will take a longer time to put into the cache. So uh, how well do, do these attack work, attacks work? So uh, it appears that they work pretty nice. Uh, so uh, we did some measurements where we uh, tried to determine uh, how long it would take on average to uh, to differentiate between two resources where the difference of the resource size is on the x-axis. So uh, as you can see for the classic timing attacks, uh, it takes uh, well like nine seconds to determine uh, a difference between file size uh, for files that are uh, twin, uh, 15 kilobytes uh, different. Uh, so it still works, but uh, these attacks were executed on our university network, which is relatively stable. So the measurements that we here obtained were in the favor of uh, these classic timing attacks. Uh, but it's also interesting to point out that here for uh, where the difference in file size was five, uh, 40 kilobytes, uh, you can see that the attacker didn't manage to uh, perform his timing attack. And most likely that was due to an, some kind of network irregularity that, uh, well, that happens when we executed that experiment. Now, when we look at uh, the browser-based timing attacks, so the green, blue, and purple, uh, you can see that uh, they perform uh, much better than the classic time index. So even when the difference in file size is just five kilobytes, uh, well, the worst uh, time attack still manages to uh, differentiate, differentiate between file sizes in less than five seconds. Uh, and when you look at the best performing timing attack, so the cache plus video parsing, so when you put the resource in the, into the application cache and then do this uh, video parsing attack, you can see that in yeah, less than a second, you can differentiate between files that are only five kilobytes different in file size. So I will be showing a short demonstration now. Uh, and here I will focus mainly on Facebook. So Facebook has this uh, functionality where as a Facebook page, you can create a post and you can limit the visibility of this post. So you can make sure that uh, the people that can see your post are from a certain location or are all men or women or are of a certain age. So, for instance, people that are 26 can see this post, and when you're not 26, you can't see this post. And you get, uh, well, the, well, so when you try to request it, 
and you're not allowed to view it, then you get this short error message saying that you can't uh, view it because you're not in the, uh, well, the scope of the post. So in the demonstration, I will try to uh, discover the age of a user. So this is any user visiting any website. So you could go to newyorktimes.com uh, where there's a malicious advertiser or he could, could go, he, he could go to cutekittens.com and uh, get his age exposed to the administrators of uh, cute kittens uh, and so on. So the uh, attack requires some preparation by the attacker. So the attacker first creates a number of uh, Facebook posts uh, which are each targeted to users of a certain age. Uh, so, as you saw before, you could, uh, well, you could uh, limit the posts to a certain range of ages. So, you well, the attacker first uh, well, creates a post that's visible to people of the age uh, 13 to 22, uh, 23 to 32, and so on. And then he will try to determine the range of the age the user is in. Uh, and that's because otherwise the attacker would need to uh, do a lot more requests. So here you do some kind of, well, not really binary search, but uh, something similar. Um, and then, uh, well, when attacking the victim, uh, the attacker makes the victim fetch the corresponding resources, so the posts that were made. Uh, then obtain uh, timing measurements for them, uh, and then try to determine uh, the range the, of age the user is in uh, regarding the value of the timing measurements. And then uh, in the third step, he will try to determine the exact age of the user uh, by just repeating uh, well, this uh, process again. Um, so, here you will see a lot of boxes, uh, and the boxes are just box plots uh, with the timing measurements. Uh, so here you can see that here it says start downloading resources. So that's the first step. So the attacker uh, downloads the resources corresponding to these things. Uh, so these, this is a post uh, targeted to people of the age 13 to 22. Uh, 23 to 32, uh, and so on. Uh, so it takes a while to download the resources, uh, and then it will start obtaining timing measurements. So after, well, actually less than 10 seconds, or well, with some certainty, uh, around 11 seconds, uh, you can see that uh, the timing measurements for the resource of users uh, in the age of 23 to 32 uh, is significantly higher than uh, the rest of the timing measurements. So that allows the attacker to know that the victim is uh, of the age between 23 and 32. So that's uh, well, 10 different ages that he can uh, well, B. So then again, he does the same attack, but then for the specific age. Uh, and you can see already that for the age 26, uh, the timing measurements are uh, again significantly higher than for the, all the other ages. So in less than 30 seconds, uh, the attacker is able to determine the age of uh, the user. Uh, of course, that was just an attack that we launched against Facebook. Uh, actually, there's a lot of, well, many, many more uh, attacks that can be done by using these browser-based uh, timing attacks. So on LinkedIn, for instance, it's possible to, uh, well, to retrieve information about the connections of a certain user that's on a website. Uh, with Twitter, 
it's uh, possible to determine uh, which users the user is following or uh, in an extreme case even uh, try to determine the identity of the user. Uh, for Google, we found that it was possible to, uh, well, to browse into your search history. So any search term that you enter in Google uh, gets saved by Google, and then later on you can search it. But of course, if you can search it, search it, uh, an attacker can also search it. Uh, so it allows them to uh, know things about what you searched for. Uh, on Amazon, uh, it's the same thing, but with your shopping history, uh, and well, on tech discovered by someone else. Uh, yeah. Uh, allows you to uh, search, well, so in, on Gmail you have this search box where you can put something in uh, and as an attacker you can make the same request and then uh, figure out how many responses were returned. And that allows the attacker to basically search into your inbox. Uh, so, I, well, these are just things that we looked at. So. I think I spent like 15 minutes for each one to figure, well, to come up with one of these attacks. Uh, so there's many more because there's many more web service, web services, and well, because the these attacks they exist by design of the web. Uh, most of them are vulnerable. Uh, so uh, because these attacks are quite uh, uh, frightening, I think. Um, it's best to try to come up with some kind of mitigation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these are not as easy uh, on the, well, neither on the client side as on the server side, but especially on the client side, uh, it's very hard to mitigate these attacks. Uh, and that's because uh, the attacks are there by the design of the browser and the web uh, in general. Uh, uh, well, a very simplistic way of trying to uh, mitigate these attacks would be to reduce the resolution of the timer. Uh, but unfortunately, that wouldn't work because uh, well, if you make the attacks a bit more intelligent, uh, the uh, resolution of one millisecond is already sufficient. So for instance, for the video parsing, uh, you could simply parse a video uh, multiple times after oh, in a row, uh, and then uh, a resolution of one millisecond would uh, already suffice. A promising uh, solution might be to uh, disable third-party cookies. So, uh, when, you, well, when you're on newyorktimes.com and you make a request to facebook.com, uh, if the cookies are not, not attached to that request, uh, well, the response that will be returned will not be based on the state of the user. So, that way, the attacker will not be able to learn anything about knowing the size of that response. Uh, so that's something that you can do on the client side. Uh, so there's also a same, well, the same site attribute on cookies, uh, which need to be implemented by the server side. Uh, so the main goal of these same site cookies is to prevent uh, things like cross-site request forgery uh, and thing. Well, uh, the way it works is that uh, it sort of also. Uh, that disables uh, well, third-party cookies, uh, but again, uh, it requires an implementation effort by the uh, well, by the website that is going to be attacked. And because there's so many websites, um, it's unlikely that all of them uh, will implement this. Uh, so I've mentioned before that the cause of these attacks is related to cross-site request forgery because in cross-site request forgery uh, the cookies are also attached to the request and that allows 
well, the attacker to make some state changes uh, at the well at the well website uh, for the user. So if you can prevent uh, illegit illegitimate uh, cross-origin uh, requests, uh, so for instance with a CSRF token, uh, these attacks would be prevented as well. But here it's not only the post requests, but also the get requests. And putting a CSRF token on every request, it might just be a lot of overkill. Um, so basically, uh, the security of browsers regarding these time attacks, uh, it's not ideal. And uh, it will likely remain bad. Uh, so we even uh, discovered some new type of attacks, uh, which we'll, we will be disclosing. So me and a colleague will be disclosing these attacks uh, this summer. Uh, and these attacks allow you to determine the exact response size uh, instead of an estimate. Uh, but the good thing is that it's possible for browsers to mitigate at least one of these two attacks. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, browsers tend to, well, or browser vendors or standards people tend to take quite a long time, at least in my experience, to uh, try to fix these issues. So to conclude, uh, so I've presented these, this new type of uh, browser-based time attacks where we measure the time it takes to process a resource. So that's, that happens after the resource has been downloaded, uh, which makes that the attacks are much faster and more robust than the classic timing attacks. And uh, one of the major issues is that uh, these side, channel, side channels, uh, so these timing side channels, they exist by the design of the web and the browser. Uh, so it's unlikely uh, that these uh, timing attacks will go away. Uh, and well, another issue is that many major uh, popular uh, web applications are vulnerable. Um, so we are, well, definitely not there yet uh, regarding a mitigation. Uh, so uh, it will be interesting to see what the future will bring and whether well, attackers or malicious people will start using these attacks or not. Uh, we will see. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Okay. If there's no questions, and thank you for listening.